uh, the first car I ever bought, I went with a big wad of um, $50 notes, $1,500 of $50 notes in my, in my pocket with my father-in-law. It wasn't my father-in-law at that time. He was the father of my girlfriend. And um, I went to this place in Croydon and parked on the side of the road there, Parramatta Road, and walked in, and, and the guy wanted $1,800 for a Datsun 1600. And I said, how about, how about 1,500? He said, nah, 1,700. I said, 1,500. He said, nah, 1,600 is the last I'll go. And then I pulled out a lot of cash went like that. 1,500, he said, done. <laughs> you just have to show the cash. The, the nature of um, uh, bargaining like that is both of you have something you want. Uh, the other person has something you want. So when, you, when you're when um, you at a marketplace, if, you know, on holidays, and they're offering you a sandwich, and they say it's uh, like... Uh, 13 euro, and you saw him sell to someone just before you for 7 euro, you're going to keep on pushing until you get one for 7 euro, and you'll get it. Because he wants your cash. He wants the money that's in your pocket. And you want the sandwich, so you keep on going. You can't really do that at Coles or Woolworths. I've tried, it doesn't do it. But, you know, so, uh, but, but lots of uh, relationships, um, when you have a vested interest, and you each want what the other person wants, it works. But God has everything. Abraham hasn't got anything to offer God, and yet he, he, he takes this approach. Why is that? It's because Abram, Abraham is, is concerned about what's about to happen. Remember, it's in the context of Abraham being promised this great, great promise, and it's happened many, many years ago, and he's been tested. He's been given as a both a positive example, but also a negative example. He does stuff which really we're not meant to emulate, and he and Sarah are both positive and negative. In the story so far, and I actually think that um, gives credence to, to God's word. It's, it's not describing this unrealistic, super duper, super spiritual, never fail couple. They're human, and they've got foibles and frailties, and yet they continue to trust. A key verse uh, that we've looked at, key verse um, over the last few weeks, and if you haven't been here, that's fine. I'll tell you what it is. It's chapter fifteen. If you've got your Bibles there, just turn page one page back, and chapter fifteen, verse six, is a really key verse. In, the, in Genesis, we're only 21 pages into the Bible, and it always it becomes one of the key verses, not just of Genesis, but for the rest of the scriptures, for the rest of the Bible, this verse becomes what is called a Bethel verse or a red letter verse, an important verse. It's this. Chapter 15, verse 6. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. That is, Abram was right before God because of sheer trust. It wasn't because Abram was perfect. If it was because Abram is perfect, he's stuffed. He, he, he's not going to make it. It's because he trusted in the promises of God. And, and that's why when it comes to this prayer, it's interesting. He's relying on God's character to actually do what he's asking. And what is he asking? He's asking God to spare the city of Sodom. And later on it says Sodom and Gomorrah. We know about Sodom already. By the time we've got to this chapter, chapter 8, we've already heard that Sodom is a place where there was great evil. And so, as a result, God, in visiting Abram and his three men, he counts as three men, and Abram addresses him as one Lord, and the one Lord answers. We took, looked at that a bit last, last week. And then this week, it's three, and then two disappear, and it says Abram stayed with the Lord. So it's like he stays with one of them, and the one becomes the Lord, um, or uh, communicates to God as the Lord. And, and the Lord says to himself, shall we reveal our plans to Abram? Shall we do this? Because Abram is the one we've chosen. He's, he's going to be the father of a great nation. He's, he's going to be the blessing of all nations. Shall we, shall we reveal to Abram? Because he's going to lead his children in, in the right path. He asked that question, and it's in the text there, not because God doesn't know, but we as the readers or the we as the onlookers are eavesdropping into God's thoughts so we can see that God has a plan. It's to help us to understand the narrative, to help us to understand what's actually happening. Um. <clears throat> Look at that verse there, uh, verse 17. This is what I'm, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? Abram will surely become a great and powerful nation. 
Verse 19, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children, his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So a great blessing which comes through living the right way, living in the way that God has designed, living a way which points others to God's nature. Now remember, this is all happening before the giving of the Ten Commandments. This is all happening before the temple, before the tabernacle. This is all happening before the extra revelation that we have in the Scriptures. There's no Bible at all. This account is a description of what happened when God revealed himself to the great patriarch before there was a scripture, Abram. And Abram is talking directly to God, whether, whether sometimes it's visions, it says he fell into dark sleep last time we looked at it, and sometimes it's somehow verbal, sometimes it could be in his mind, it's hard to know. It's just like, you know, when God speaks to me, it's through his scriptures, usually. Sometimes I have inclinations, sometimes I, I sense and I know that some people have visions, that's fine. God uses all different methods the point is, is it the God of the, who created the, the heavens and the earth, the God who created you, who's speaking to you or not? And are you trusting in that God? He trusted and it was counted as righteousness. He's right. And the same Lord looks at Sodom and it's anything but right. It's evil. And his plan is, this is really politically incorrect. And you know what? If I was writing the Bible, I'd skirt over this bit and sort of not talk about it. But he was going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. Some, sometimes our initial reaction is, oh, that's bad. Judgment is a bad thing. But just let's just put, out, put this up in our context. In our context, when you read a newspaper article about an evil person, someone who abuses a child physically, sexually, emotionally, someone who tortures someone, someone who murders someone, someone who who does a terrible crime which invades that person's personhood. A natural reaction is we want justice to be done. Not necessarily let's go and wipe that person out or, or be vindictive towards that person, but that person needs to face justice. And that's because within us, God has created within us a sense that there's something called right, a right way of living, and there's something which is wrong or evil. Uh, you could use the word sinful. You could use the word falling short of God's character. You could use all sorts of phrases to describe it, but things which actually aren't matching with the way God has created us to live. And that is the way the people in Sodom are living. If you want to read stories, there's a few stories in the Old Testament which talk about the things they do. In fact, if you read on the next chapter, you'll see some of the things they did, things which are despicable and, and ghastly. And actually, the sorts of things... You really don't want to read to your kids. It's, it's, it's like, it's just sharp descriptions of things which are done in the dark, which make us realize that evil isn't just a modern concept. It was way back then. This is, this is many thousands of years ago. <clears throat> and so Sodom is facing their judge. And God's plan is to wipe it out. And so in that context, Sodom says, uh, uh, Abram says, just wait a second, in Sodom, sure, you're going to lock it up, but what happens if there's, and he tries to think of a smallest number possible, what happens if there's 50 people who, who've got a right relationship with you? He's probably thinking of the smallest number possible. We're not sure how many in the city, but, uh, and, and the Lord answers, well, for the sake of 50, I won't, I won't wipe it out. And he thinks, wow, that, that's, that's a good news, but maybe I should go give it a lower number. What happens if there's far less than 50, 45? Yes, but say 45, well, what, 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 oh, really? What about, what about 30? The way 30. What, what about 20? And he goes down to 10. And after 10, he stops praying and says, God leaves. We're not sure why he stops at 10. And um, <clears throat> actually, the story ends with God bringing judgment out. So the implication is there's, there's not even 10 people who are, have a right relationship. And then Lot and his two daughters escape. Definitely by the skin of their teeth. And Lot's wife, remember the story, looks back. What happens to her? What happens to Lot's wife? Anyone know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's sulfur and uh, sounds like volcanic and things from the sky. And she just is mineralized into salt. Just as an interesting thing, I read, read that people, when they're covered in lava and, you know, sink in these sorts of things, their body imme immediately gets dehydrated and turns basically into a salt-like substance. So that's probably what happened to us. Terrible story. 
<clears throat> in fact, whenever I read, this is one of the strongest stories of judgment. We've already had it in Genesis already. Of course, with the flood, the great flood. We've had judgment right at the beginning before that with Adam and Eve when, when they sin and God. God pronounced a curse. It's a terrible story, a terribly dark story. And then the story of Noah and the story of Babel. Remember, God scattered. So there's been judgment already in the first few verses, first few chapters of uh, Genesis. And that's because God, as a holy creator, has the right to set his standards. God, as a holy creator, doesn't turn a blind eye to things which are not right. Abram knows that. Abram's interrupted with this God. Abram knows now, he's got some insight that God's plan is to bless the world, to bring about good things in the world. That's what that's one of his heritages. That's one of the things that he's headed towards. And he's got a relationship with God where he, he understands that and he wants, he wants God not to judge the righteous. He, he thinks maybe, maybe God's being a little bit too over the top here. But uh, God's standard is very high, isn't it? And it's still the same God we relate to now. And God does promise to judge here. And that, that promise, the promise of blessing is great. We love holding on to that. We love holding on to the good things of life. We love holding on to the, you know, the, the honey and the sweetness and the beauty of God's blessing. And that's great and appropriate. But sometimes we tend to turn the volume down on God's right as a right God to say that's not wrong. But wouldn't you feel it'd be terrible if a judge, human judge, knew that someone was doing the wrong thing, you know, um, corrupt and uh, doing evil things, terrible things that he should be convicted for. And he goes, you know what? It really doesn't matter. Just go on doing it. I won't, I won't, I won't bring you to justice. That's fine. Uh, that's not his job. Uh, sometimes there's a, a stereotype of God which is uh, spruced and thrown around where God is, is um, all loving and that doesn't have any ability or desire to judge at all. Now, it's true that God wants us to recognize our need for him and come to him for mercy and trust him. That's God's great plan. He wants to bless us. But it's also true that God takes evil, Sin. Seriously, remember the outcry? He talks in that text. He says, I want to go down and check out some um, Sodom and see if the outcry matches what's actually happening, matches the outcry. That is, he hears the outcry. He hears and knows what is happening. He knows when we have done what is wrong. In our own bodies, the way we've been designed, even if we don't know any Bible, even if we haven't really got a relationship with God, We've got something called a conscience, which is just a human sort of inward dial that works out sometimes when we've done the wrong thing, when we've lied, when we've when we've let people down, when we've when we've acted out of a sinful motive, a selfish motive. As we read God's word, we're introduced to God's character through the Ten Commandments and through God's character, and that conscience is educated, and we become more aware, which is a good thing. And it makes us realize what? We need to trust God. We need to recognize that God is a God who actually can show mercy. We need to trust his promises. As people who have not just the first 25 um, pages of the Bible, we've got a whole lot all the way through to the end of the New Testament. And in that, we, we hear the wonderful truth. Born is the king. We're entering into the December Got a few weeks until we remember the coming of Christ. Why did Christ come? Well, the New Testament says Christ came to fulfill the promises that were originally given to Abraham to bless the whole world through him. Christ is the great, 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 great times something, 24, son, grandson of Abraham. There's a whole history of Israel between Abraham and the coming of Christ. There's a whole history of church between Christ and our day, and we still look back to Abraham as, as the initial um, promise made that God was going to bless uh, the world through him, all nations through him. How? By making us right. How? By trust. Does that mean we deny God's holiness? No. 
Does that mean we're fearful of the Lord? Well, only if we don't trust. If we don't trust, even if we're not as bad or as evil as the people reading the newspaper or the people of Sodom, if we're not trusting the Lord, there's some danger in falling into the hands of a God who takes holiness seriously. Now, I don't want to make you scared. I actually don't want to do that. But if God wants to speak to you tonight, he can. He can speak to you and say, trust me. Recognize that, I, recognize that I am your king. I'm the one who created you. I know your inmost thoughts. I know your needs. I know your plans. I know what you want to pray for. And I want to answer those prayers. But you need to take me seriously. I want to relate to you honestly. And I want you to relate with me honestly, says the Lord. We've got the advantage. We've got so much more advantage than Abraham. Abraham just had these, I mean, he had amazing experiences, of course, God taught him through. But we've got the whole history to look back and see how in Christ, God was reconciling the world to him through his death. Why did Jesus die? Well, it's because of judgment. Jesus died to pay the price for all the people who don't live out God's character perfectly. Now, I don't want to place myself on the equivalent level as the people of Sodom when I read the story of what they did and terrible things. I'm, I'm repulsed. And yet the Bible tells me that without Christ, if I was to face judgment, I don't think I'd have that much over Lot's wife. I think I'd turn into a pillar of salt. But with Christ, with what Christ has done, I can have hope. Why? Because Christ interceded for me. He prayed for me and he died for me. So that's that's really why we call believing in Christ, recognizing the king has come at Christmas time. He came as a baby, but then he rose. Uh, he, he lived and then died and rose again at Easter. Easter and Christmas do go together, don't they? We don't believe in just a baby and leave it at that. We believe in a baby who grew up and became the saviour. And uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says, Christ himself is interceding for us. He's doing what Abraham does. He's praying for us and looking, looking after our interests, our best interests. That's what Christ is doing. And Abraham here is so concerned for the potential loss of people who shouldn't die in Sodom. He's praying and bargaining with God. I don't know about you, but is that how you pray when you're praying? Do you pray for lost people? Do you pray for your neighbours or your friends, your family members who don't know God? Do you pray for people you know who, who are lost and are facing an eternity without God, without Christ? Or has that become something which is a sort of a no-go area? For me, often, I don't like my personality. I'm a very positive. I'm an optimistic person. If you know me, you'll see that's true. You know, I can have four flat tyres and I'm like, ah, oh, something, it'll be, it'll be okay, we'll be right. I can be lost on the side of the road. I said, I'll say, we'll get home somehow. And some people say that's delusional. Well, it might be. But as a result, I, I sometimes don't really like facing up to the reality of God's right as God to judge. Well, I think this passage tells us that he's serious about that. But he's also serious. Remember his response? If I just find a few right people, I'm not going to wipe out the city. God is very tolerant. In the song we sang, he's slow to anger. He's very slow to anger. He's very patient with us. Last week, we talked about the importance of trust and patience. God wants us to trust him. He wants us to be patient with, with delivering his promises. Why? Because he's very patient with us. Do you pray for the souls of the people around about you? If you're a Christian, if you're someone who trusts Jesus, that is such great news. And I said last week, and it's true, God can answer all your prayers. Be patient. Pray about your finances. Of course you should. Pray about your family situation. Of course you could. Pray about your sickness. Of course. Please bring all those things to the Lord in prayer. Why? Because he's listening. He's yearning to enter into your life and answer those prayers on his terms, not yours. Keep that praying on those things. But God wants you to pray for the salvation your friends and family. Why? 
Because unless they are right with him, they're lost. Do you believe that God has the right to do that? Maybe you've got questions. That's okay. But God, as a holy God, doesn't want to turn a blind eye to things that are not right. But he's also a God who wants to show mercy and he wants to credit trust as righteousness. Trust him and pray that other people would be able to place their trust in him too. The wonderful thing about the New Testament is just for the sake of one man, God saved not just one city, but the whole world. I think, I think we had a, a favourite promise, uh, Eli's favourite promise last, last week. John 3.16 it was great. A great um, verse. The verse after John 3.16, John, John chapter 3, verse 17 says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. What are we saved from? Saved from feeling inadequate? Not really. Saved from hardship? Not really. Saved from poverty? It's up to God, but that's not the promise. The promise is we're saved from condemnation. Because God wants to condemn everything that is not God within our hearts. He wants to condemn everything that is dark in our hearts. He wants to condemn all the evil that we read about in the paper that we hear of. We, our blood curdles and our, our soul is full of anguish when we read about these terrible things and have innocent people dying. And then we realize just wait a second, when God looks in my heart, he can see darkness there too. And God condemns that. But he doesn't condemn you. How does that work? He doesn't want to wipe away everything with his judgment. He wants to save. And as we trust in his word, he credits that as righteousness. Who is God's word? It's Jesus. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is our great sacrifice. Jesus is the great promise um, fulfiller of the whole Bible. Jesus is our um, Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Do we believe that? If we believe that, it'll shape our prayer lives and we'll pray for our family members who aren't yet Christians. We'll pray for people in our street we're trying to relate with. We'll pray for the people, even people we don't particularly like who aren't Christians, and we'll pray for our Christian friends that they'll continue in the faith. And this Christmas, that's what God wants you to do. Intercession. Right now, think of someone you know, someone you love, who isn't a follower of Christ. Just any one person. I can think of many, but I'm thinking, I'm focusing on one. Think of that person. And let's bring that person to God now. In your head, you just think of that person. I'm going to pray a prayer. You pray for that person. And why don't you make a commitment to pray for that person up until Christmas? What is it? Four weeks? Pray for that person. You might want to add people. I said, that's good, but this one. And if you're coming to church, either here or someone else, invite them to church with you. Where they'll hear, hopefully, a crisp, clear message of why Jesus came and how they can have righteousness, righteousness credited to them because they trust in Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we bring before you this person. You love them. You know them. You created them, and they need salvation. Give us courage to pray for them earnestly, and we ask, please, for their sake, you would not send judgment on them, but save them because of that one person, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Mike.